Sex, Revolt, and Ecstasy, Spain's Golden Centuries. The readings for this lecture are Tirso de Molina, The Playboy of Seville, Lope de Vega, Fuente Ovejina, just a summary of that, and uh, St. Teresa de Avila, uh, and San Juan de la Cruz, that is St. John of the Cross, uh, poems, a selection that are uh, available for you. Note, this video lecture is roughly an hour long, and there are three readings that support it. You are not required to watch it all at once or to do all the readings at one sitting. You should feel free to break your watching and reading down into smaller sections to make it easier to understand and remember. You have one week to complete the module. Working on it little by little is absolutely fine. Take a break when you need to. It's a good idea to watch and listen to the entire lecture and to do all the readings before trying the quiz and then posting to the creative discussion. This week's meditation topic will also be posted. It's optional. And the deadline to complete it will be about two weeks from now. If you have any questions about assignments for this class, be sure to email me, the instructor, at fogelj, that's F-O-G-E-L-J, at montclair.edu. So first, a review. Last week, we took a look at three types of new world that inhabitants of Europe were encountering during the 14th to 15th centuries. First, Giovanni Boccaccio's cool Italian poetry slam crowd of Florence, Firenze, and Naples, Napoli. Petrarch, Boccaccio's friend, was experimenting with sonnet forms, and Boccaccio himself was creating encyclopedias of myth and writing the Decameron, a 10-day storytelling extravaganza of 100 stories from various places on Earth, set in the midst of the horrific pandemic of that time, the bubonic plague, also called the Black Death, before the printing press was developed. Boccaccio and his friends, the new poets and visual artists of Florence, were just beginning to develop a new style of art and life. They wrote in the vernacular, commonly spoken language, not Latin, but local Florentine Italian dialect. Dante, another Florence native, had started this trend in the previous generation. Boccaccio and his friends were open-minded, educated, and had an international flavored artistic take on the world that would lead to so many innovations in the arts during the next couple of centuries in Europe. Two, the new world imagined by the early Catholic humanists, which contained more freedom of conscience and speech than the strictly caste-structured church doctrine focused elite driven middle ages both erasmus 1466 to 1536 and thomas more 1478 to 1535 who were both catholic priests were born 30 years after the printing press was invented for both friends education in latin and greek writing beautifully and powerfully in latin and speaking out and writing against injustices that they saw was a way of life. Both remained intensely loyal to the church, but also sharply critical of its corruption and abuses, wanting to reform it from within. Erasmus, 12 years older than Moore, was born in the Netherlands, but traveled widely to England, France, Italy, and beyond. Moore was born in England and also traveled, but remained mostly in England, where he became a counselor to Henry VIII. Both Moore and Erasmus championed freedom of education and going back to the sources, ad fontes, of ancient authors, including the ancient Greek of Plato and other authors, the Latin of Cicero and other ancients, and also the Greek and Hebrew of the New and Old Testaments, as they call them, of the Christian Bible, to take a fresh, unmediated look and think again about the basis of human society. Moore even wrote Utopia, the first science fiction novel of Western Europe that envisioned a country where real social justice and equality of humans existed, a place where no money corrupted people, where women and men were equal, where all religious faiths based on conscience could coexist, where there were no prisons, and where slavery was limited to those convicted of crimes. Finally, 
we took a brief look at the new world, this is number three, encountered by Christopher Columbus, Cristobal Colon, and his men beginning in 1492, the West Indies and the rest of the Americas. Exploration and exploitation of this world was led by the Spanish, first and foremost, under King Ferdinand II and Queen Isabella I, often called the Catholic kings or the Catholic monarchs. We saw the terrible violence, torture, enslavement, and death that Columbus and other explorers rained down on the Native Americans they met, and we saw that some Catholic priests, notably Bartolomé de, la, de las Casas, did speak out against this reign of terror, but were not heeded. We also briefly looked at some of the interesting new plants, materials, and animals that were brought back on Spanish ships to Europe at this time, in particular, cochineal red pigment created from small red insects living on prickly pear plants in the Americas and cultivated by native uh, artists. New dyes, materials, cloth, and foods, like bananas and potatoes, for example, transformed the arts, clothing, and culinary world of Europe in the 16th century and later. This lecture will focus on Spain. We'll read three different humanist authors from the early Spanish Renaissance, representing three different but related tendencies of the European Renaissance, or rebirth, as it means, of classical and other ancient learning. All three of these humanists were, once again, Catholic Christians. In fact, like Thomas More, one became a saint. So, number one, before we start, some history. We'll take a look at the world of early Renaissance Spain, which was marked and shaped by La Convivencia, which in turn created the context for the Spanish Siglo de Oro, the Golden Age or Century of Gold, in the 15th to 16th centuries. Number two, then, in this lecture, we'll take a look at the sexual and gender revolution taking place across Europe during the 15th to 16th centuries. In his play, The Playboy of Seville, er, er, El Burlador de Sevilla, the renowned Golden Age, Sigla de Oro playwright, Tirso de Molina, throws some tomatoes at the hypocrisy of the nobility and upper class aristocracy within Spain. His anti hero, Don Juan, goes around tricking already married women of all classes, including the very upper class getting them to sleep with him by disguising himself as their husbands and lovers, and thus disgracing them, sometimes some of the women fight back, however, and their families, and revealing the double standard of the time. Finally, he does meet his match, however, as all the women he's tricked converge with their lovers and husbands on Seville, and he himself is literally dragged down to hell by, well, you will need to read it to find out. Three. Next, in this lecture, we'll look at class uprisings during this period. To do this, we'll take a brief look at the life of and read a summary of one of the plays written by another Siglo de Oro Golden Age poet and playwright, Lope de Vega. His play, Fuente Ovejuna, uh, Sheep's Well, is a, a translation of it. It's the name of the small town in which it's set tells the story of a peasant uprising in the countryside of Valencia that took place about a century before he was born. Both this play and the Playboy of Seville are examples of honor plays, plays in which the dramatic action turns on the actions of evil men who rape and trick women into sex, but then get their comeuppance as others, both men and women, in Lope de Vega's case, the entire town, take their vengeance out on the evildoers. Trigger warning. Both of these plays have stories that involve and sometimes comment on the rape of women. Rape is not approved of in any way, in fact the opposite, but the representation of it in the plays could prove unsettling or disturbing for you. Please take care of yourself while reading the play and the summary and stop if and when you need to. Four. Finally, we'll see in this lecture 
that Spain of this period was strongly influenced by humanist ideas about individuals being able to talk directly to the divine without mediation of the church. This religious humanism in Spain took the form of ecstatic religious experiences and prayer meant to bring the individual closer to God without the church. To see these ideas in action, we will read some poems written by Teresa, Teresa de Avila, one of the most influential people in the church at that time, later a saint, and the first woman to be named a doctor of the church, and also her younger friend, the Catholic priest, Juan de Yepes y Álvarez, better known as Juan de la Cruz, or John of the Cross, also later a saint and doctor of the church. Number one, La Convivencia and the Beginning of the Golden Age. To begin with, let's go back and briefly revisit Boccaccio, 1313 to 1375, and Italy during the 14th century. Reading Boccaccio's story of the Muslim Sultan Saladin and the Christian Italian Messer Torello and his wife, we noticed that Boccaccio went out of his way to de-emphasize faith differences between the two friends and in fact to brush right by the Crusades themselves with hardly a word, even though Torello literally fought in a crusade and wound up imprisoned by Saladin's army during the story, and highlighted instead the cultivated and sophisticated friendship developed by the Sultan and the Italian trader. The Sultan even shared his reign in Alexandria with Torello and made sure his friend got home quickly to rescue his wife by wafting him through the sky overnight. The tone of the story is, we can't do anything about needing to fight in crusades and such, but our real life consists of acting like gentlemen, making friends and treating strangers well, sharing our wealth and talents generously, and acting with honor and respect toward all people of goodwill regardless of their background, and regardless of the circumstances we find ourselves in, such as wars, prison, etc., that we don't have any control over. In another story, at the beginning of the Decameron, Saladin appears as a character also, and asks a question of a Jew, Melchizedek. Which of the three religions, Judaism, Christianity, or Islam, was the right one. In response, Melchizedek tells the Sultan in, in Boccaccio's Decameron a story of a man who had a very special ring that he had inherited from many generations past of fathers passing the ring to their favorite sons. This man had three sons whom he loved equally. So before he died, he took his unique and special ring and had a master craftsman reproduce it two more times so perfectly that it was impossible to tell which was the original and which were the imitations. On his deathbed, he gave each of his beloved sons one of the three rings. Each of them would inherit his legacy, and none could say which was better or more authentic than the other. At the end of the story, the Jewish Melchizedek says to the Muslim Saladin, I say to you, my Lord, that the same applies to the three laws which God the Father granted to his three peoples and which formed the subject of your inquiry. Each of them considers itself the legitimate heir to his estate. Each believes it possesses his one true law and observes his commandments. But as with the rings, the question as to which of them is right remains undecided. So Boccaccio's moral for the story is aimed at Christians of his day. Allow people of faith to follow their own beliefs. Also, all three Abrahamic faiths, as they're called, are from one root, one father, and should respect one another as brothers. They should not fight with one another or discriminate against each other, but treat each other as equals and leave aside any disagreements about which specific religious and cultural customs were correct. None of the three faiths really, on the whole, 
of course, lived up to this ideal. But it does matter that for Boccaccio and other humanists, religious tolerance and freedom of conscience was an ideal, something to strive for. This humanist ideal meant don't judge others' religions. Your soul is between you and God, not you and the church or the church and God. In Spanish history, this ideal was particularly relevant. On the Iberian Peninsula, the area of Spain and Portugal, Muslims, as we saw, had ruled the vast majority of the territory for almost eight centuries from 711 to 1492. The Umayyad Caliphate invaded the peninsula after gaining control over North Africa from Egypt to the Atlantic Ocean, given the fact that and given the fact that so many unpopular and corrupt Christian nobles and aristocrats held power over the land, many Spaniards willingly accepted Muslim rule as a great improvement. The rule of Abd al-Rahman III, 912 to 961, consolidated and articulated the rules. Al-Rahman looked to unify al-Andalus by promoting Christians, Jews, Arabs, Berbers, ethnic North Africans, some Muslim and some Christian or even Jewish, um, including ex-slaves, to high public offices, mixing his administration and creating laws that would make peaceful coexistence possible. Within all of the large towns of Al-Andalus, in addition, lived communities of Jews as well as communities of Christians. All three groups, Muslims, Christians, and Jews, lived and learned from one another, especially sharing the new knowledge coming from the scientific and philosophical fields in the Islamic Middle East during this period. Universities were founded, students exchanged and copied books in the various languages, Hebrew, Greek, Latin, Arabic, and design principles were shared and large impressive buildings, waterways, streets, and paper mills were brought into existence jointly. The coexistence of these groups, called in Spanish la convivencia, coexistence, was famous throughout Europe and the Mediterranean. It even inspired some, like Boccaccio and Moore, as we have seen, to utopian dreams of a society where religion was not a barrier to friendship. Life in Spain during La Convivencia, coexistence, was not always peaceful. Territories and cities would be taken over by armies, settled and governed for a century or two by Muslims or by Christians, and then tides would turn, and the other group would take over the area for a century or more. Sometimes, as in Granada in 1066, there were even religious riots, in this case mass killings of Jews by Muslims over a conservative religious shift that not only killed many, but destabilized relations between the faiths. But the Spanish convivencia remained relatively stable for many centuries, largely without open warfare. This stability was made possible by a network of legislation and customs of taxation that allowed the groups to feel they were treated relatively fairly, even when not in power. When Muslims controlled a territory, they used a religious law to define non-Muslims who were nevertheless people of the book or of the Abrahamic faiths as dhimmi, or protected peoples. The idea was derived from Islamic legal conceptions of membership in the larger society. Non-Muslim dhimmis, that is, Jews and Christians, were given protection by the state against any who would try to stop them from practicing their religion, for instance, and did not serve in the military. In return, dhimmis played, paid taxes to the government. When Christians took over an area, they used a non-religious, secular form of legal edict to make a similar concession toward Muslim and Jewish community members. Again, a tax was paid, protection was offered by the government, and all groups lived together in the same cities, following the same artistic trends, learning architecture, languages, and philosophy from one another. The major language of culture and learning in these areas for 700 years or more, eight, close to 800 years, was Arabic, 
Arabic was used among the local elites, Muslims and Christians, and the prevalent vernacular in many areas was a continuum of Arabic-influenced local Romance dialects. Spanish Christians even balked at the idea that they should switch to speaking Latin in church. They wanted to keep with the old ways of speaking in Arabic. Interesting side fact. Modern Spanish contains around 4,000 words that come from Arabic, 8% of the Spanish dictionary. Among these are many words that begin a or al, which is the Arabic word for the, such as azúcar for sugar, aceite, oil, almendra, almond, alcázar, castle, alcalde, mayor, algebra, <laughs> algebra, alcantara, bridge, and many more. In addition, the word hasta, meaning until or toward, comes from the Arabic word hatta, of the same meaning. The word naranja, orange, comes from Arabic also. And the word barrio, neighborhood, comes from the Arabic barri, the limits of an area. The Muslim empire did not enslave any non-Muslim groups under its rule, nor actively influence them to convert to Islam. But there were in fact many converts to Islam anyway during this period, largely because Arabic and the centers of Islamic learning were the center of culture and art in Spain. This changed in 1492. For decades before that year, the Muslim rulers and caliphates had been losing ground within Spain to Christian armies fighting battles that, as they saw it, of reconquest, reconquista, inspired in part by the ubiquitous crusades sponsored by and encouraged by the leaders of the church. Most major areas and cities fell, in the words of Professor Maria Rosa Menocal, like dominoes. Cordoba in 1236, a city, a city famously named by the Saxon Christian nun and writer Roswitha of Gandersheim, the ornament of the world, she called it. Valencia in 1238 fell, and Seville, or Sevilla, in 1248 fell to, back to the Christians, which had been the capital of, that, of past Muslim rulers, Seville had. In Seville, which became the new Castilian capital, the impressive Great Mosque was reconsecrated as a cathedral. And, quote, in the spirit of the age, Alfonso, son of Ferdinand III, King of Castile, when his father died, had his tomb, as he was a Christian, inscribed with the three venerable languages of the realm, Arabic, Hebrew, and Latin, as well as the upstart Castilian language, that only poets and other revolutionaries were writing in at that point, end quote. The quote is from uh, Menokal's book, The Ornament of the World. By 1492, only one Muslim governed area remained within the Iberian Peninsula, Granada in the Southeast. Within the, cap within the capital city lay the Alhambra, the red one, a magnificent palace and fortress complex built and developed by consecutive emirs beginning in 1238 with Muhammad I ibn al-Ahmar, the founder of the city. It is one of the best, uh, one of the most famous monuments of Islamic architecture and one of the best preserved palaces of the historic Islamic world, in addition to containing notable instances of Spanish Renaissance architecture. Uh, to this day. With armies and recaptured towns at their back, Queen Isabella I and King Ferdinand II, known as the Catholic monarchs or the Catholic kings, forced the last Nasrid rulers of the region of Granada to sign away any rights to govern, promising that any remaining Muslims would be welcome to stay in Spain once the Alhambra and Granada was handed over to King Ferdinand and Quid Queen Isabella. But upon taking up residence in the Alhambra, which they used for their royal court, the king and queen promptly issued the Alhambra Decree, expelling most non-Christians from the realm. 
There were some exceptions in Valencia and Aragon, mainly Muslim communities that had kept to themselves and were paying the all-important taxes to the crown. A mass exodus ensued, with Jews and Muslims whose families had lived for centuries in Spain, fleeing mostly to Portugal. About 120,000 Jews fled there, where, however, King Joan II quickly enacted policies to push out the refugees, such as implementing extremely expensive entry and residence permits valid only for eight months, after which they would have to flee. Also, those who could not pay the fees were sold into slavery. On top of this, the king cruelly separated parents from their children, whom he sent to the Atlantic island of San Tomé off the West African coast, a savage place full of large predator lizards and snakes where the children were dumped on the shore and abandoned. Muslim states in North Africa received the second largest number of Spanish Jews, about 20,000 of a total of 175,000 who fled. In particular, the King of Morocco made it possible for them to join a, a welcoming and large Jewish settlement already thriving in Fes. Jews were much safer in a Muslim polity than they were in any Christian state. On top of this, Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand had, over a decade before, in 1478, already founded an aggressive, systematic, and frequently violent Spanish Inquisition, a kind of secret police operation led by government officials who questioned, really tortured, and sometimes murdered suspicious citizens, uh, adjudicated them in a kind of court in an effort to purify communities of any non-Christians, especially those who might tempt Christians to participate in non-Christian community customs or religious holidays. This was aimed especially at communities of new converts to Christianity. Jews who had converted were called conversos or converts, and Muslims who had converted to Christianity were known as moriscos or Moorish Christians. The Inquisition was often used politically as well, with Christians wishing to get ahead accusing other Christians in order to remove them. The new order of Spain was born. But changes like this, the end of the convivencia, do not happen overnight, or even in years or decades. The influence of Islamic culture in Spain continued to be felt beyond 1492 throughout the Renaissance, and can be perceived clearly to this day. It is this event, the expulsions of 1492 and the formal end of the era of the Convivencia, that sadly marks the beginning of what has been called the Golden Age of Spanish art and theater, but which has also been characterized by historians as the Age of Conflict in Spain, because this tightening of Catholic rule over the lands under the Catholic monarchs meant an increase in local tensions, an increase in suspicion of one's neighbors, and the igniting of numerous enmities, even local massacres and pogroms. Spain was not immune to the waves of reform sweeping through the Catholic Church, but Isabella and Ferdinand were interested primarily in criminal, criminal justice reforms, uh, Isabella organized and adopted a citizen police force, the Holy Brotherhood, that aimed to bring down the amount of literal highway robbery and to rein in corrupt nobles, and monetary gain they were also interested in because the previous Castile monarchs had sold off much of the royal lands at very low prices, something that Isabella aimed to recover. So their attention was not with this particular, you know, uh, injustice. The voyage of Columbus helped Isabella and Ferdinand refill their coffers as well, obviously, and to a large degree helped Spain win in their rivalry at sea with Portugal. Isabella and Ferdinand were not particularly interested in challenging the church or in the new spirit of personal conscience. In fact, they were so doctrinaire that the Pope honored them publicly and called them servants of the Holy Church. 
By the time of Martin Luther and outright challenges to the Catholic Church throughout the rest of Europe, the Spanish Inquisition was already well established. It was 40 years old and was able to move quickly against any Protestants. Spain was not a place where Protestantism took hold, and as Italy was not really a place like that. It remained firmly Catholic down to the present day. Nevertheless, the artists, dramatists, spiritual leaders, scientists, students, and poets of Spain were sensitive to the idea of reforming society and the church from within. They, not their political leaders, remained involved in the Catholic humanist conversations that surrounded them. Just a reminder of these, Erasmus, Thomas More, Boccaccio, and all the other humanists we have met so far were royal Catholics. The Spanish artists saw the abuses of the nobles, the outrages against women, the degradation and maltreatment of poor people, and the corruption of the church leaders. They were not immune to the idea of uprisings against local nobility. And due to Isabella's interest in policing, they even sometimes thought of the king and queen, nostalgically perhaps, as past allies of the peasants and the middle-class traders against the corrupt and vicious local aristocrats and nobles. They also saw and remembered in the next centuries a strong and educated female leader in Isabella I, and an ever-increasing number of well-educated women in Italy, Sicily, France, and other areas with trade and cultural connections to Spain, including North Africa and Morocco, which had received so many Spanish Jews and Muslims as exiles that it offered almost a second home base for many Spanish families that had been broken apart by the expulsion. They remembered and retained their ancient universities and maintained connections with the sources of ancient Greek and Roman pagan texts, again often through Muslim and Arab travel routes. And they expanded their contacts with other nations and places in Spain as they became more wealthy. Not just the huge amount of new materials, ideas, and peoples from the Americas, but also the literature and painting of Italy. In 1442, in fact, the Kingdom of Naples had been conquered by the Spanish King Alfonso V of Aragon, who quickly converted it into a literary and cultural center. So the Spanish Renaissance and the 16th to 17th centuries Spanish Golden Age, Siglo de Oro, really close to two centuries, 1492 to 1686, was the result of disengagement with foreigners, including Italians. This period saw the rise and development of architecture, design, and literature. It was a, a period of extraordinary cultural flowering and the innovations and originality of writers in each of the three literary genres, poetry, drama, and novel are remarkable. In particular, the novelist Miguel de Cervantes, uh, Don Quixote de la Mancha, an affectionate parody of the popular picaresque style novels of the day, uh, where a central figure, usually a sort of disreputable but energetic man, a guy's guy who falls into adventures over and over, some of them wildly improbable, and many of them having to do with love. <laughs> so, uh, so Miguel de Cervantes uh, wrote this, this classic novel based on that. And the playwrights Lope de Vega, who wrote Fuente Ovejuna, which you're reading part of this week. De Vega was Spain's most prolific playwright. He wrote over a thousand plays during his lifetime. And Tirso de Molino, the playboy of Seville as is his uh, drama, which you're reading this week. As you probably noticed, the Playboy of Seville's story begins in Naples, Italy. This is because in 1442, the Kingdom of Naples had been conquered by Spain, remember, Alfonso V, and converted into a literary and cultural center, and uh, cultured, uh, cultured Spaniards traveled to Italy, to the Kingdom of Naples, 
to uh, acquaint themselves with the latest trends, and Italian scholars were invited to Spain as well. Having this foothold in Italy changed the art and literature of Spain during the Siglo de Oro. Spaniards, because they now had roots in Italy as well, started to read Italian literature, such as Petrarch's Love Poetry, 1304-74, and uh, Boccaccio's Div Cameron and the short stories in it, and more, contemporary works as well. Two, sex and honor. Sexual revolution was also in the air, Spanish style, in the 16th to 17th centuries, during the middle of the Siglo de Oro, Golden Age or Century of Gold. Just as today, our most famous U.S. artists, hip-hop artists, creators of movies, plays, and books, are concerned often with the gap between rich and poor and the injustices suffered by people due to gender, race, and class, in the same way, the Spanish writers living in the wake of the end of the long period of coexistence, La Covivencia, worried about their own social systems and society. They saw the Spanish Inquisition being put to political use, and they saw that rich nobles de facto owned many local governments. These rich noblemen were extremely powerful and had been abusing poor and middle-class women, molesting and raping them, and getting away with it due to a lack of legal protection for women, and exploitation of the cruel double standard of honor imposed on women. Spanish women of all classes were often expected by the men in their lives to keep their reputations untarnished and to marry the men chosen for them by their family without questioning or talking back. Any other action would endanger the family's honor. It's not hard to imagine that this idea was not exactly popular with the women themselves. And golden age playwrights such as Tirso de Molina and Lope de Vega saw the hypocrisy of this too. They wrote plays supporting independent women and criticizing the honor ideology, wanting to make their audiences think and change their ways, as well as usually laugh a little bit. So it's no surprise that in the play, The Playboy of Seville, El Burlador de Sevilla, by Tirso de Molina, we meet one of these feckless rich nobles by the name of Don Juan, a character that Tirso created with the purpose of getting their audiences angry at the privileged, hypocritical, and completely insensitive and cruel rich noblemen who were taking advantage of women of all classes and raising awareness about the damage they were wreaking on society in Spain. And it's not just about women either. Um, go ahead right now and read through at least some of the play. It's a complicated plot with lots of sex and some violence. Warning, do not read this comedy lightly. To help with a complex plot, here are four true love stories that are included to follow as you read it. The story begins in Italy, as we said, Naples, and then moves back to Spain. So, uh, first love story. In Naples, Italy, Duke Octavio is in love with the Duchess Isabella, who's the lady-in-waiting to the Queen of Naples. Don Juan, our villain, who happens to be in Naples, Italy, tricks Isabella by disguising himself and sneaking into her bedroom, then gets caught. So the Duchess Isabella since she really is in love with Duke Octavio and to save her own reputation, pretends that the man in her bedroom, Don Juan, was actually Duke Octavio, hoping it will blow over that the king will be lenient toward her and Octavio because they're clearly in love and are going to marry soon and her honor won't be lost because, of course, she's the one who's going to be in trouble for this. And so is Octavio. Um, so this leads to some complications. Octavio gets arrested and Don Juan's uncle, Don Pedro, in Italy, because he's the ambassador from Spain, knows the truth, but he still favors Don Juan, his nephew, and wants to get Don Juan married to Isabella. But Don Juan just wants to hightail it back to Seville in Spain for more mischief. So that's the first love story. The second love story 
in Seville, in Spain, Doña Ana is in love with the Marquis de la Mota and he with her. The complication here is that the Marquis is a good friend of Don Juan's. They're going out together to paint the town red the night before the Marquis and Ana will be married. And Don Juan tells the Marquis that he's going to play an elaborate trick on a woman by disguising himself. And then intercepting a lover's letter from Ana to the Marquis, because of course they've been in communication because they love one another, and telling the Marquis the wrong time to meet her in her bedroom, he, Don Juan, disguises himself as the Marquis and appears to Ana, his own friend's betrothed, at the right time in her bedroom. Before he can completely trick her, however, she figures out that he's an imposter and screams. Her father, Don Gonzalo, appears with armed guards, and in trying to escape, Don Juan accidentally kills him. Now, this is a tragedy. He lies to his friend, the Marquis, when he meets up with him again. But since he was disguised as him when he killed Don Gonzalo, remember, Doña Ana's father, the Marquis gets arrested and is going to be executed for murder. Later, the King of Castile puts up an impressive statue to commemorate the dead Don Gonzalo and dedicates it to avenge his murder. Also, Octavio, who's now kind of mad at his beloved Duchess Isabella because she lied about him, is now set up by the King of Castile to marry Doña Ana instead of Don Juan, who had been his, her father's choice for her because Don Juan's uncle wants him to marry Isabella instead. Nobody is asking Doña Ana or Isabella whom they would like to marry, of course. Okay, so that's our second romance, is Doña Ana and the Marquis, but the Marquis is in prison. Number three, in Dos Hermanas, Spain, on the way to Seville. Arminta is getting married to Patricio. They're both middle class and in love, but Don Juan sees the wedding happening and makes a U-turn so he can attend and ruin it. Since he's a nobleman, they can't say no to him as he starts shamelessly flirting with and pushing himself onto Arminta at her wedding. He convinces the bridegroom Patricio, or Patricio, by talking with him that he has actually been secretly visiting Arminta for six months and that she is in love with him, Don Juan. This is all a lie, obviously. Patricio, believing him, steps down out of honor, respecting the apparent wishes of Arminta and Don Juan's apparent mad love for her. Uh, he's sad. But then Don Juan convinces her father, Gasseno, of the same thing and asks for her hand in marriage. Then he sneaks into Arminta's bedroom. She's waiting for Patricio, actually tells her that her father has given her to him as wife, to him, Don Juan, and that her marriage to Patricio is canceled and that he hates her and promises her that he, the noble Don Juan, is madly in love with her and will happily marry her and give her all sorts of expensive gifts, etc., etc., if she will make love to him now. Of course, he disappears the next morning. Note how neither her groom, Patricio, nor her father actually asked Arminta herself about the situation. That is what makes this trick of Don Juan's possible. They trusted Don Juan and didn't even consult the woman. So that's the uh, third love story, is Arminta and Patricio, and they've been tricked. The fourth love story that Don Juan intervenes in near Tarragona, Spain, on the way to Seville. Uh, he passes by this little village, Tarragona. Tisbea is a very independent, not in love woman, or so she says, but her friend and admirer, Anfriso, is always courting her. He's in love with her, even though she pretends not to want him. They're both working class. Tisbea is a fisherwoman. Once again, Don Juan, this time in a boat with his servant, Catalinon plays a trick. They jump out of their sinking boat and Catalinon saves him, supposedly, 
with the help of Tisbea, who's just being kind to a stranger. After she revives Don Juan, who knows if he was really unconscious, probably not, he professes his love to her uh, and uses his status as a nobleman again to dangle the idea of marriage. He comes to her at night, then disappears in the morning. Tisbea is furious. Never believe a word any man says, she says. And Anfriso is totally on her side. He, he lo still loves her very much, and he totally supports her. So when Isabella passes by on her way to Seville, all three of them are heading to Seville together to get vengeance on Don Juan. How does Don Juan get his comeuppance for all of these four tragic love stories that he's created? Well, watch out for that statue. Uh, do all the lovers get married to their beloveds? Spoiler alert, yes. So as you can see, the play's plot is incredibly complicated and I haven't even included any of the subplots and minor characters. Here's the takeaway. A lot of the situations in the play spring from the fact that nobody is paying attention to the women's own desires for their various lovers and that Don Juan can get away with stealing, actually raping, literally anyone's bride or girlfriend, not just because he disguises himself as her lover, although he says he loves doing that, but because he can pull the rich nobleman card on the woman, on her father, on her lover. He is absolutely untouchable until he literally kills another nobleman. And that is, in fact, the problem that Tirso de Molina is talking about in his play. This play asks us to follow a thoroughly despicable, privileged, and hypocritical deceiver around as he seduces, deceives, kills, and rapes until he is rightly dragged down to hell by the consequences of his actions. One of the major problems that we're being asked to address is that this supposed nobleman has no honor, and he doesn't even value honor in the abstract. Don Juan literally says about talking to Patrizio and convincing him that his bride was not in love with him, this is Don Juan speaking, he says, I vanquished him by appealing to honor. These peasants are always consulting their honor as though they carried it in their hands. And no wonder, after so many deceptions, honor has fled from the city to the countryside. So that is, he says, I am a sophisticated nobleman, and I set no store by honor at all. Honor is a stupid concept that's prized only by country peasants. So you can see that Tirso de Molina is a playwright who, no matter how many jokes and crazy situations he is including in his play, wants to criticize his own society. He objects to the treatment of women, especially their lack of freedom in choosing a husband. And this is not the only one of his plays that features arranged marriages with no say given to the woman about whom she will marry, proving to be hoaxes or worse. Because this is a comedy, comedia, or at least a tragic comedy, Tirso creates a happy ending, except for Don Juan, who doesn't deserve one, but we should notice that the ending is only happy because he has paired off lovers with those they really do love, not with the people chosen for them, whether by parents or kings. Arranged marriages are stopped and thwarted by true love. This is a new idea. In a sense, it's the comic flip side of Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. And it's easy to see how it fits in with the individualist currents of humanism and points at the double standard for men and women. Is it feminist? <sighs> Tisbea, the fisherwoman's proud assertion that she is independent and will never be tamed by or give in to any man, her outraged advice to women not to trust the word of any man, and then her strong decision to go into Seville and take Don Juan to court to get vengeance on him, comes pretty close to a statement of women's rights, although full-blown feminism was still centuries away. Tirso de Molina was a Catholic priest from the age of 20. He continued to write social criticism plays for the rest of his life, sometimes getting into serious trouble 
for criticizing higher-up figures in the church and state. Three, revolt. Another Golden Age dramatist and one who wrote over 1,000 plays in his lifetime, Lope de Vega, also often had in mind so social critique. Often, like Tirso de Molina, he stuck up for women's rights. And in his most famous play, Fuente Ovejuna, he uses a historical uprising that took place a century before his time to tell his contemporary audience about the importance of solidarity against the abusive noblemen. Again, they're the, they're the villains. Um, so we can kick these noblemen out, he says, as long as we stick together as these townsfolk did. Take a moment now to read through the summary of this play and the notes about its context and characters, which is the second of your readings for this week. If you get a chance to read the whole play at some point, you may enjoy the way that Lope de Vega intertwines the stories of love, as in Playboy of Seville, with the story of the uprising of the little Spanish town of Fuente Ovejuna, in English something like Sheep's Well against the vicious nobleman who has been exploiting it and molesting its women, as the, the commander. Just as in Playboy of Seville, the ultimate overthrow of the nobleman, in this case the commander Fernán Gómez de Guzmán, depends largely on a coalition of those whom he has exploited and abused. Just as in Playboy of Seville, the commander is in the habit, like Don Juan, of waylaying and raping women. His first act in the play is to try to kidnap Laurencia and lock her away so he can have sex with her. She and her girlfriend fight back, and her boyfriend and fiancé comes to the rescue also, threatening the nobleman with a sword. In order to protect the youth, the entire community stands up to the commander's wrath. They even endure torture, led by common, lower-class peasant men and women of the town. The watchword that passes through the town is, don't say the name of anyone. Say it was simply Fuente Ovejuna who did it. So they're protecting her boyfriend. The commander is overthrown when these common men and women stand up to him this way. Think of the scene in the movie Spartacus where thousands of slaves refuse to give up their fellow slave to death, confusing the authorities and hiding Spartacus himself by all claiming, I am Spartacus, I am Spartacus. Here the townsfolk say, it was Fuente Ovejuna, the town itself, who did this. In Lope de Vega's play, ultimately, the townsfolk who are rising up against the commander are vindicated and supported by the new king and queen of Spain, Ferdinand and Isabella. Leaping over the local authorities, the people of the town call upon the monarchs of the entire country, and those monarchs do respond in the play, ascertain that the commander has been acting illegally and cruelly, and they help the town to get rid of him. It's an inspiring play, and like Lin-Manuel Miranda's play Hamilton, it makes use of a famous historical event to make an argument for change today. Lope de Vega took the story of Fuente Ovejuna from a real peasant uprising that happened in 1476, about a century before he was writing, at the time of the beginning of the reign of Ferdinand and Isabella. Lope de Vega himself, 1562 to 1635, lived later under King Philip II, Philip III, and Philip IV of Spain. But the problem of noblemen exploiting country folk and small towns remained even after that time. Lope de Vega thought it was time to remind his friends and audiences, and perhaps even the king, that collective action by the victims of upper-class exploitation could change things, and that the king's role was to help his subjects, to make sure that villainous men like the commander were never again able to exploit poor Spanish folk. So he created a legend out of that uprising. Part four, 
ecstasy. Quote, 16th century Spain was the golden age of mysticism, end quote, as Charles A. Frazzi in Newman, writing in 1967. What is religious mysticism, and why was Spain a particular center for it? Mysticism is defined by the Oxford English Dictionary as belief that union with or absorption into the deity or the absolute or the spiritual apprehension of knowledge inaccessible to the intellect may be attained through contemplation and self-surrender, end quote. In short, mysticism is a belief that one's subjective experiences as an individual, like one's emotions, for instance, can be linked to knowledge of and experience of God. One might think of this idea, unmediated experience of the divine, as being diametrically opposed to life within a church structure, the Holy Roman Empire, the Pope, the bishops, the priests, and other mediators of religious experience for the masses of Christians. And it is. Although the history of the church was full of individuals who claimed to have experienced God directly, the rules given by the centralized church generally directed good Christians to listen to their priests, bishops, and so forth, and absolutely not to try experiencing God themselves. <laughs> Direct divine experiences by the uneducated, so to speak, were too volatile and hard to handle for church structures. Who knew if these experiences came from God or the devil, the bishops and clergy asked trying to delegitimate and make people afraid of trusting their own divine encounters. Nevertheless, average people kept having these experiences. A very large number of saints within the church, even, had gained acceptance as saints by flying in the face of the church for a while and insisting on the validity of their spiritual experiences and direct connection with God. It was a fine line. Also, many of these saints... Think, for instance, of Joan of Arc, another early Renaissance figure living in France, 1412 to 1431, were burnt at the stake for the st very same reason, before being awarded their sainthood posthumously. So the Catholic Church had a sort of hate-love relationship with the idea of mysticism historically. In the 16th century, in the middle of the Siglo de Oro, Spain's Catholic Church began to embrace mysticism more fully. There were several reasons for this. First reason, the most obvious reason is the long period previous of La Convivencia, which set the scene for interfaith mysticism better than in any other area of Renaissance Europe. Spain had been for centuries an ideal place to look for conversations between the Abrahamic faiths, as we've seen, as a result, in the late medieval period and early Renaissance, Spain was predictably the focus of new mystical religious practices that stretched across all three Abrahamic faiths and emphasized the connection of an individual directly with God. The meditative and spiritual practices that were constantly developing to support this attitude of direct communication with the divine were common to all three faiths. In your reading, the poems of two Catholic Christian humanists and mystics, Teresa of Avila and John of the Cross, are reading number three. We will also discuss, after you read, some of the Jewish and Muslim incarnations of this idea during the Siglo de Oro. Two, a second important reason for the Spanish Church's ability to embrace mysticism during this period was the waves of humanist Christian thought coming through the Catholic Church itself, usually from other lands. We've already seen that Erasmus, a Catholic priest, was strongly influenced by Northern humanism, which led him to want to reform the Catholic Church from within and turn more to laypersons and one's own conscience and education than to church institutions, bishops, and the church's bureaucracy. And Thomas More also stood them down, remember. Erasmus and his kindred, kindred spirits had created the groundwork for a meditative practice that supported Spanish nuns and friars, separated them from traditional power and money paths within the church, 
and often gave them new credibility after eras of being considered corrupt. A third reason for the flourishing of mysticism in Spain during this time was the flow of new money and the rise of the Spanish Empire as a world power. The Siglo de Oro saw the tearing down of the old aristocracy and its replacement by a new class of rich traders and businessmen, rising even from the groups that had previously not been favored. For instance, sons born out of wedlock, but with an enterprising streak, or daughters within a family who joined a local convent instead of marrying, but still maintained access to funding from their families or even their own investments. And in Teresa's case, the glad sponsorship of new enterprises by Jewish conversos, Muslim moriscos, and other rich non-aristocrats in Avila, or new aristocrats, really, you could say, as well as her own funds, the income from the Americas played a not insignificant role in changing the ground rules for funding church-related projects too, as Isabella and Ferdinand had shown. Teresa of Avila, 1515 to 1582, whose original name was Teresa Sanchez de Cepeda y Ahumada, was a Spanish noblewoman and a local celebrity in her home province of Avila. Avila, situated between Madrid and Salamanca and just above Toledo, was a central province of Spain, famous as a very culturally and religiously mixed area. Her family was a good example of that mix. Her grandfather, who hailed from the Andalusian city and province of Toledo, was a converso, a Jew who had converted to Christianity and he had been condemned by the Spanish Inquisition for allegedly returning to the Jewish faith. This is her grandfather. He confessed and was given a minor penalty. Afterwards, he moved the family to Avila, but kept up commercial connections in Toledo and Salamanca, eventually establishing a substantial cloth and woolens business. He purchased land around the area and ultimately was given the honor of a knighthood, and his sons were also given this status by the Chancellery of Valladolid. Teresa's father, one of the four sons, used this commercial background of his father and the knighthood to establish himself as a successful wool merchant and one of the wealthiest men in Avila. He married into local nobility and had three children, but when his first wife died, he took her third cousin as a bride Beatriz de Ahumada, who was of the Castilian nobility and a rich heiress, so money marrying into money. Of their 10 children, some of the boys ultimately traveled to the Americas and in particular became conquistadores in per Peru. Teresa was very attached to her mother. Beatriz died when Teresa was very young, which left Teresa longing for her for the rest of her life. As a young woman, Teresa was flashy and charismatic, a rich young woman who enjoyed her social life and read popular romances. She went to a school with the local nuns and once when she was only seven, ran away with her brother to go fight in the Crusades. They didn't get much beyond the walls of the town before being discovered and brought back by an uncle though. <laughs> she became a nun at 20 years old, not by her own choice, but pressured by her family but entered the local, easygoing Carmelite convent of the Incarnation, where the cloistering rule of separation from the world was very lax. Uh, this is pretty typical of the time. Visitors came in and out all day, and the nuns not only saw their families regularly and kept all their inherited money, clothing, and jewelry, but even did political and business networking from the convent itself. This experience of being a socialite nun later led her to want to reform the system, and ultimately, she did this by breaking away and founding a different, stricter convent with fewer nuns, just 15. Meanwhile, Teresa had been reading many writings on spirituality, especially those written by humanist theologians, such as Francisco of Osuna, 1492 to about 1540, a Spanish Franciscan friar who wrote a book, The Third Spiritual Alphabet, 
that was popular at the time and argued that friendship and communion with God are possible in this life through cleansing one's conscience, entering one's heart, resting in loving stillness, and then rising above the heart to God alone. As Teresa read more and more about mystic union with God, not only did she become more serious about her vocation, but she had a near-death experience with illness. She had always been somewhat sickly as a young woman, but in the convent she came very near to dying, spending almost a year in bed. When she recovered finally, she began to experience occasional episodes of religious ecstasy. Now the word ecstasy comes from the Greek words ek, out of, and stasis, a stable position or standing, that is, a kind of out-of-body experience, standing outside oneself. In religious contexts, it's used to refer to an altered state of consciousness. The person in ecstasy seems to withdraw from the world around them and turn inwards, but their own experience is of an expansion of their mind and spirit, reaching out into the world and beyond it. That's what they experience. As from the outside, you can't tell what, they're, what is happening with them. Often, someone in ecstasy experiences visions and feels that their mind is expanding into places they have not been before. Often, they feel extremely happy, euphoric. The episodes can last for a few minutes or seconds or for several days or more. Teresa, like many, experienced these episodes many times during her life. From a psychological perspective, ecstasy may come from many different sources or triggers. Certainly religious mysticism, the focus on and belief in spiritual exercises that lead an individual's soul to the divine, but also sexual intercourse, yoga, intense physical exercise, runners sometimes experience it, the use of certain hallucinogenic drugs, etc. Teresa was a highly effective influencer in her time. This may be due to her susceptibility to such extreme, even neurotic, emotional experiences and her very intelligent use of them to push change. William James, the psychologist and philosopher, writing in 1902, comments on religious ecstasy in particular that someone who is both highly intelligent and emotionally sensitive or susceptible to a high degree, feeling things unusually intensely, neurotic, a state of being called sometimes crankiness, insane, temperament, borderland insanity, obsession, loss of mental balance, etc., is more probable to make a mark and affect their age than if their temperament were less neurotic. <laughs> such people, he claims, are doers rather than thinkers, and, quote, if there was such a thing as inspiration from a higher realm, it might well be that the neurotic temperament would furnish the chief condition of the requisite receptivity, end quote. That's from his book, uh, varieties of religious experience, you can easily read more details about Teresa's eventual foundation and restructuring of her own convent and the men's monastery of Carmelite friars as well, ultimately with the blessing of the Pope, although with strong opposition from some priests who called her disobedient and stubborn and objected to her presuming to teach as a master against the orders of St. Paul that women should not teach. Uh, she's very conscious of this, if you read her autobiography. Reading her poems can tell us a lot about how she imagined her mission, but also her own personal connection to deity. The idea of this personal connection is something that she and others of this age were acquiring, as we already saw with Erasmus and Thomas More, and which ultimately posed a huge challenge to the church's political authority. This turned to a personal, as opposed to an institutional, connection to God, as much as we take it for granted today, was a game changer and one of the huge forces that created the Renaissance itself. Also included in your third reading is a very famous poem by one of Teresa's protégés, a young friar who also experienced such ecstatic episodes, Juan de Yepes y Álvarez, better known as Juan de la Cruz or St. John of the Cross, who was also from a Jewish convert or converso family. It's worth thinking about that. Under Teresa's influence, he led the reform of his own Carmelite male monastery. 
John wrote a short poem included in your reading this week titled, not by him but later, The Dark Night of the Soul. Beyond the Church, Ecstasy in Spain and Beyond. Teresa and John were part of a larger interfaith movement at the time that included also Jewish mystics, including those practicing Kabbalah and later Hasidism, and Muslim mystics, including but not limited to the large and important group of Islamic mystics called Sufis. Let's take a brief look at just three connected ecstatic mystic traditions in Judaism and Islam that arose at this time and came together in Spain because of its con uh, uh, convivencia background. Jewish Kabbalah, Moses de Leon, 1240 to 1305, it was a, a century before, was a Spanish rabbi who paved the way for many Jewish mystic traditions, most prominently those called Kabbalah, which used numerology and mystical approaches to the Hebrew alphabet and scriptures to give its practitioners a direct pathway to God. In modern times, pop music star Madonna, among others, has studied Kabbalah. De Leon, born in Leon, ultimately also settled down in the city of Avila, Teresa's city, more than a century before Teresa's family, where he stayed for the rest of his life among the Jewish community and wrote the Kabbalah's foundational book, the Zohar, there. Kabbalah, a century later, was an idea adopted especially by the popular Hasidic movement, which was based largely in the idea that individual human beings can communicate directly with the divine. Muslim mysticism. Also at this time, Muslim mystics called Sufis were becoming more prominent. Sufis believed also in a direct communication with the divine, and they practiced dhikr, or practice, that consisted of dances, songs, and meditative physical exercises that aimed at achieving religious ecstasy, in Arabic, wajad, or waj. Sufism had been a prominent part of Indian, African, and Spanish Islam since at least the middle of the 12th century, mixing with the indigenous Hindu culture in India. One of the most famous examples of Sufi dhikr is Sama, the practice of whirling, or dancing ecstatically in faster and faster individual circles. It's a practice that may have begun by the famous, been begun by the famous 13th century poet and mystic Jalaluddin Rumi, R-U-M-I, R -U -M -I, 1207 to 1273. Fraternities of Sufis called dervishes or darwishes who lived lives of poverty and prayer, rather like nuns or friars in Christian orders like the Carmelites, uh, became known for this type of ecstatic dance and are sometimes known for this reason as whirling dervishes. This type of ecstatic dance is still practiced today by the Suvi dervishes of the Medlevi order and has been recognized by UNESCO, who in 2005 proclaimed the Medlevi Sema Ceremony of Turkey as one of the masterpieces of the oral and intangible heritage of humanity. But this trend of deinstitutionalizing one's connection to the divine that we've seen in Teresa, St. John of the Cross, and the Jewish Kabbalah, and the uh, Muslim mystics, the, the dervishes, was not confined to the Abrahamic faiths. In what has sometimes been called the global renaissance, within India, during the same time, the Hindu Bhakti movement was developing. It reached a peak between the 1400s and 1600s CE. This was a movement within Hinduism, a non-Abrahamic faith, that sought to bring religious reforms to all by emphasizing meditation, devotion, and prayer centered on different gods and goddesses to achieve personal salvation. This movement used local languages, the vernacular, to reach the masses and cut through caste and gender restrictions. For a good representative of the Bhakti movement, or Bhakti, check out the story of Mirabai, a 16th century female Hindu mystic poet and saint and devotee of Krishna, sort of an Indian uh, Saint Teresa. Epilogue and Upcoming 
We have covered a lot of territory in this lecture. Let's break it down. One, la, la convivencia. We discussed how the coming together of the Abrahamic faiths and cultures within Spain laid the groundwork for the special kind of Renaissance that Spain later experienced. We also saw the break with this tradition in 1492, which is a year often used to mark the birth of the Golden Age in Spain, even the birth of the world, as one modern book puts it. Two, social justice during the Golden Age, Siglo de Oro, in Spain. We took a look at two plays criticizing social norms during this period. First, Tirso de Molina's play, The Playboy of Seville, talks about the double standard and the need for more women's rights in the era. His evil but memorable villain, Don Juan, stands in for all the privileged nobility taking advantage of poorer women. Since it's a comedy, all of the women Don Juan has taken advantage of gang up on him in the end and take him down, or would have if he hadn't already been literally taken down to hell by a vengeful statue set up to honor a nobleman he killed during his adventures with the women. B, or second, Lope de Vega's play, Fuente Ovejuna, takes aim at the double standards around honor and abuse of the poor. Again, the upper-class nobility of the time were using their privileges to abuse women, and in fact to abuse all of the people in lower classes. In this play, the town of Fuente Ovejuna decides to rise up against their local nobleman, villain, the commander, and stick together in complete solidarity in order to overthrow him and save themselves. They're supported in this by the new king and queen of the realm, Isabel and Ferdinand. Both Tirso de Molina and Lope de Vega were social reformers who wanted to see change. They tried to make change through their plays. Three. Mysticism and Religious Ecstasy. Finally, we looked at the religious side of humanism. In Spain in particular, a very strong tradition of personal connection to divinity was taking shape not just in the Christian community, but also among Jews and Muslims, and even beyond. Saint Teresa of Avila and her, and her younger Saint John of the Cross, Juan de la Cruz, both from families that were converts from Judaism, became famous both for their ecstatic visions of Jesus and for their active reforms of the church, bringing the religious orders they belonged to away from their social club forms, as kind of like the nobleman uh, you know, version, and closer to an ideal of meditation, poverty, and good works in the world. This emphasis on mysticism and direct connection to the divine was shared by all the different faiths in Spain and around the world even at this time. Summary. These are some forms that humanism took in Spain. A new awareness of the rights of individuals, especially the poor, personal connections with the divine that challenged every religious institution. The change was fueled, as we saw, by Spain's long convivencia, a convergence of faiths and cultures, the humanist ideals being promulgated by people within the Catholic Church itself, and last but not least, the influx of new money to Spain from the Americas, which led to the ability of some non-nobles to amass enough wealth to revolt against the aristocracy, to challenge the privileged classes, and bring them down like Don Juan. We'll revisit Spain to look at its important contributions to art during this period, in a later lecture. For those interested in learning more about the amazing ferment in Spain during the Siglo de Oro and before and after, here are some good books and articles and some websites to browse too. Next week, we're heading to Italy.